must stay sensitive to God and his word. And our scriptures in Acts 28, verse 23 through 31. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him and to his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Some believed the things which he were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well, spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are full of dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. And 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressionly, that in the latter times shall, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy today. We ask you, Lord, to instill your word within our hearts, open our understanding, help us, Lord, to draw closer to you. We give you all the praise and the glory for it, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. We must stay sensitive to God and his word. A story about Johnny says that Johnny had already swum his .93 miles and cycled his 24.8 miles. Just reading those two together can make us normal people feel like we need a protein bar, and a nap. But Johnny, the last prong of his way, laid before him, and he must run 6.2 miles before calling it a day. He had trained for this, so he attacked the first five miles like a pro with around 400 yards left to go. He showed signs of trouble. He slowed down, began weaving and waving back and forth, and his head bobbled like a newborn. His brother, Ace Dale, was only two paces behind him in third place. He now ran up behind his brother, pulled his brother's arm around his neck, and carried him over the finish line. That is when Johnny collapsed. Everyone was inspired by his brother's selfishness to care more for his 
family than for his own fame. But everyone also wondered what went wrong. The answer was simple. Johnny was overheated. It cost him the race at the very end of the race. Had he swum, cycled, and run so far, so fast, only to lose in the last quarter of the mile? Yes, starting matters. It's very important. But finishing matters more. We've always heard this and said it. It's not the one who goes the fastest, but it is the one that finishes the race. That is the message the uh, apostolic Paul passionately wrote to Timothy. He knew that there would be believers who would live for Jesus and then fall out of the race along the way just before the coming of the Lord. As persecution and disappointment would beat down upon us, we cannot afford to lose heart or lose out with God. To lose heart is to be discouraged. We must stay close to God. That's why our title is, We Must Stay Sensitive to God and his word. If we stay close to God, keep our soul, ourselves, full of his word, keep our spirit consumed with his spirit so that we can cross the finish line and hear him say, well done, my good and faithful child. That's what's important. Individuals living in North America are continually bombarded with some form of news. Some cable channels, radio stations, internet websites, social media outlets are devoted to delivering news 24-7, usually with a conservative or liberal agenda. It is not only easy to find news, but also individuals can choose to receive news that best fits their political or personal ideas. It's that much news that somebody bound to tickle your ears. Paul presented the good news everywhere he went. Everywhere it was good news. However, Paul's audience could not file away the message for a later consumption. The news he preached put them in immediate agreement or disagreement. The gospel is no different today. Audience are divided and ultimately defined by their response to the gospel. Chapter 13, the story transitions from following Peter and other key disciples of Jesus to instead focusing on Paul's missionary journeys to the Gentile world. Believers are first introduced to Saul, also known as Paul at first. He was known as, you know, introduced as Saul and then became known as Paul in Acts 7. When he held the coats for Stephen's executioners. Then in Acts 9, when he is confronted by the Lord on the road to Damascus. Another transition is made when Luke, the physician, joined Paul on his journey, began in Acts 16, verse 10. This moment is crucial as we observe Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul's travels took him to several key cities throughout the world. His purpose was the same in each and every city. He preached the same message. 
He testified of the kingdom of God at each stop. Paul would first begin preaching to the Jewish synagogues in Acts 17, 2, and then in each case would some believe and others would not, but then afterwards reaching for the Jews, he would go and turn to the Gentiles in that city. And in Acts 28, readers find Paul in Rome, the heart of the world at that time, faithfully following his model and achieving the same response to his message. Everywhere Paul went, it was the same. In Antioch, Paul and Barnabas publicly presented the gospel to all who would hear the message. That's in Acts 13, 13 through 52. And as always, some believed while others rejected the gospel. Some of Paul's converts were those who had been a part of the Roman society. One notable example was Lydia, a woman from Thyatira, who for, re for reasons unknown chose to establish a place of gathering for prayer beyond the gates of the city. Another significant example was Aquila and Priscilla, who had recently located Pericardius' decree to remove all Jews from Rome. Not only did they receive the gospel, but there are also examples of those of prominent standing that also received. Acts 17, verse 4. The common denominator of all those that believed was not their social standing or how much they knew about the Bible. It was what was common between them was the fact that they put their trust in Paul's message of God about Jesus Christ, the gospel, and they responded in faithful obedience. Just as there were those who believed Paul's message, there were others who did not. More or less, that's what we see today. Whether believers experienced direct opposition to their faith by being outspoken people or just indirectly because of their philosophies of that present time. That sounds just like people today. They must remain faithful to God's word. Believers must submit to the authority of God's word. I believe that obedient, authority, submitting, those are words that people have problems with today. So much that they've become callous to the Spirit of God, callous to His Word, callous to the ministry of the Gospel. And it's not long until well, we read about those who did not believe in the Bible. We read about those who walked no more with, you know, Peter, Paul, James, John. They turned their back and went a different way, others. But the Bible says that all Scripture, every word that's written in the Bible, I'm a firm believer God is big enough to create the heavens and the earth. He's big enough to heal all manner of diseases. He created. He's God. He is beyond our imagination. It says all scripture given by inspiration of God. I believe he's big enough to give us what we need in the Bible, the Holy Word of God. There's nothing been added to it, nothing taken away. From Genesis to Revelation, God has a way to preserve his word that we need or what we need in his word to find salvation. When you follow the word of God, when you learn the word of God and follow, 
There's nothing in there that tells you to do something that is so terrible. Everything that it tells us that we should do and must do is a blessing to us and to others. A way of lifting us up and encouragement. Why not be sensitive to God's word? We need it to continue in a glorious life. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 My, how we need to be inspired by God and to be corrected. And when we stumble, realize we can lift up our hand and he'll take us by the hand and lift us up. God will. He shall. He's a mighty God. And yes, he loves each and every one of us. If we would just hear, like the Bible says, what the Spirit saith unto the church, God speaks to all. What is it? Many are called, but few are chosen. Because there's only a few that's willing to listen. Believers must allow God's word to have the final say in their lives. It's not what I say or somebody else says, but it's what thus saith the Lord. Furthermore, believers must be reminded that the core tent of faith is that the gospel contains the only power able to transform and regenerate fallen human beings. There is none other but the word of God that can set us free. The church must remain true to God's word and refuse to compromise. Acts 28-27 records Paul's quotation of Isaiah 6, 9-10. through 10. The first eight verses of Isaiah 6 depicts Isaiah's calling as Jehovah's prophet. Therefore, verses 9-10 through 10 are presentative of the theme of the message that Isaiah had been called to declare. At this point in biblical history, the kingdoms were divided, Israel had been destroyed, and its inhabitants removed from the land by the Assyrians. Isaiah's ministry would guide Judah towards repentance, resulting in Jehovah sparing them from the Assyrians. The people of Judah heard Isaiah's message and they repented. Thus, by quoting this verse and applying it to the Jews, Paul was giving a prophetic description of the Jews and a justification for the gospel being sent to the Gentiles. Of course, we know that the word says that he came to his own and his own received him not. Through Paul's words, the prophecy was brought in judgment to the Jews once again. It's kind of like going up the mountain and back down again. Going up the mountain, serving God, having all things wonderful and great, conquering your enemy, and then all of a sudden turning your back on God and ending up back down at the bottom of the mountain again and being overtaken by your enemies. As we study history, we find that that happened quite often. My, well, look at us today. Our country has gone up and down, repeating history. Something happens tra that's a tragic. And everybody call starts calling on God and praying. As soon as not long until that's all forgotten and they want to take prayer out of everything and off of everything. History repeating itself. Well, it brought judgment to the Jews over and over. Wonder what it's doing to us today 
as we look out around our country, around our world, things that's happening that hasn't happened before, and things so severe today that more severe than what anybody in our generations or past hundred years had seen. Folks, we need to be on the right track. We must stay sensitive to God and his word. It is a significant, it is significant that this quotation was placed in the conclusion of Acts. Luke placed this biblical reference not only as a judgment on this group of Jews, but also on the Jews in general. The native narrative of Acts began in Jerusalem and ended in Rome. Luke placed this quotation to clarify that the gospel originated from Jerusalem and voyaged, traveled to the heart of the world purely, be, purely because they would listen. Isaiah 6, 9, Isaiah was instructed by Jehovah, go and tell this people. However, in Acts 28, instead, Paul continuing to go and tell the Jews, the nar narrative ends with a judgment against the Jews. Paul's ministry in Rome continued in boldness and without hindrance, which was something Paul had never experienced in all his travels, chiefly because of the Jews. When Philip was sent to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, he saw the man reading from one of Isaiah's prophecies. Philip asked the man if he understood what he was reading. The man responded with a plea for help because he did not understand. Philip explained the prophecy and baptized the man. Isaiah 9, it was Israel who would be unable to understand. This lack of understanding was not based on an inability to hear. They could hear but an inability to understand or perceive the process. Later in this book, Isaiah expressed this truth a different way. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people, Isaiah 28, 11. This verse is often cited as a prophecy for future tongue speaking at the day of Pentecost. However, Isaiah used this verse to convey how Jehovah would speak to Israel and they would not hear his voice. They would not have trouble hearing his voice because of deafness, no, but due to their inability to comprehend his voice, what he was saying. Certainly, Jews of Paul's day heard the gospel, but they could not understand it. Was this the lack of understanding just rooted in their willful refusal or their inability to understand? It appears both of these answers were true of Jews of that age. Why were they not able to understand? This was most likely due to their preconceived ideas about God. Have you ever heard that? Preconceived ideas. There are people in this world today that have been led astray with preconceived ideas. Man has for many, many years interpreted what God wants for us. And many times the interpretation is not correct. And we can find this true by studying the word of God and looking at what we the people do. 
Just as with hearing, but not understanding, an individual can see, but not perceive. Hmm. Perception involves sight, but includes understanding the meaning or the significance of what is being seen. The Pharisees saw Jesus, but failed to recognize his significance. Not only did Paul apply Isaiah 6, 9 through 10 to the Jews, but also did Matthew in Matthew 13, 14, verse and 15. Matthew placed Jesus reference to Isaiah in tandem with the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. In this parable, Jesus described how the seed was sown in four different soils along the path in rocky ground, among thorns and good soil. The Jews seemed to be the fit for the first category, seed that falls among the path. They heard and saw, but they did not understand and perceive. Notice in his explanation, Jesus connected their inability to understand or perceive with the evil one snatching the seed, which was sown in their hearts. Readers should surmise that not only does the hardness of their heart prevent them from seeing the gospel, but also opposes the opposition of Satan, his demons, and their combined influence upon the world. They kind of mix in and agree. The Jews of the early church unknowingly served Satan's goals when they stood in opposition to the gospel. Likewise, the same is true for those who oppose the gospel today. Remember, the Bible says that you cannot Serve two gods. You're going to serve one and hate the other, or you're going to hate the other and serve the other one. And that's the same for all of us today. There's no in betweens, no maybes. It's either we walk with God or we're walking with Satan. When considering the Jews of Paul's day, it is obvious that their thinking and feeling were both far from God. However, when looking at believers' lives, the answer may not be so clear. Maybe that's because what is said from the mouth and what is seen by the life that's lived is two different things. And it's seen many times all around us. Their thinking could be close to God, represented by their diligent study of God's word, but their hearts could be inaccessible to God. The heart's someplace else. Additionally, an individual may love to worship and praise God during the congregational worship, during the altar call, and even while the prayer room, and in the prayer room, however, that individual's mind could remain close to loving the Lord by learning more about his word to ensure that the mind and the heart are accessible to God. They're sensible to God's spirit, in other words. Believers must not become passive and unmoved because of their continual access to the power and presence of God must not become passive. It's so easy to get wrapped up in the cares of life. Likewise, the mind and the heart must not become dulled instruments as they are two of the greatest gifts through which believers may worship the Lord and minister to others. We have not because we ask not. 
There are many gifts. Many gifts. Bible names a few, but there are so many. And we lose out on some of the greatest blessings of God because we are in, insensitive, because we don't know what's in God's Word. Many believers rejoice in knowing this life is not the end. And that is so true. I rejoice because I know that this is only the beginning. This is only the short end of the beginning. When I enter into eternity, that's going to be a long time. A glorious time with Jesus Christ. God continues to work in the world and ultimately Jesus will come in the last days. And we can look around us and see that we are in those last days. There are people of the world that tells us something's going to happen that's different. They know that the last days are here. Believers rejoice in this hope in the glory of God as heaven will one day invade earth. Nevertheless, many biblical authors saw that there would be a time when many believers would lose their faith prior to Christ's second coming. There's a lot of books written about losing out with God. The phrase, the great falling away, we've heard it many times here recently. That's taking from the idea in Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. All we have to do is look around us with our eyes open and we can see that our world is deteriorating quickly. Christian belief was once claimed as truth and today many of those beliefs are no longer true. They claim that they've changed. Well, this is what Paul had in mind when he was speaking in 1 Timothy 4 and 1. He envisioned the believers departing from the faith in the last days due to seductive spirits and devilish doctrines. There are still deceivers reaching out, deceiving many people today. It may be difficult for Christians to imagine what it would feel like to lose their sensitivity to God. Because some can be so cold. What is it? Lukewarm, cold, indifferent, and still go to church, still do their offering, still try to do a good deed, and yet God may look at them at the white throne judgment and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. And you'll say, I've done this, Lord, in your name, and I've done that. You see, God tries the reins of the heart. And this is why it's so important to be sensitive to God and to his word. I must try the reins of my heart and seek the face of God. Learn to be sensitive to his spirit, to his word. Sensitivity to God is so important. Isaiah, Jesus, Paul told the believers that there are those who will hear and not understand. Those that will see and not perceive. And those will develop calluses on their heart because of those things. And when calluses is on the heart, many times those are the ones that walk away from God. 
for reasons of the world, but not reasons of God's word. It's always something that someone said or done. It's that preacher or that Christian, the way they acted. Folks, I serve God for God. For myself, for me. I serve God because he said he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I don't serve God because of what other people are doing. They can have an effect on my life, and hopefully I pick and choose the good things that they do, and the bad things, I pray for them. That's what God said, to pray one for another. When believers are emotionally or spiritually injured by circumstances, there are spiritual calluses that can form on their hearts. Though Jesus and Paul both applied Isaiah's prophecy to the Jews, it remains clear the same does happen to Christians. When faced with what is difficult to understand and perceive, believers should endeavor to trust God. Faith is beyond rationality and logic. We cannot use logic and rationality. We must, we must seek the face of God. Have a deep trust in God. Our faith is in God. He's proven himself to be faithful over and over many times. When given an opportunity, we the believer should bring the heart, our heart to Jesus Christ. When things are great and wonderful and when our heart itself is hurting and we're not sure what to do, do or which way to turn, take it to Jesus Christ. Truly give it to him. I've heard people say, well, I put it on the altar. But they go on talking about everything else but what God's done with it. Let's truly give it all to Jesus. Learn to be sensitive to God and to his word. If you don't know what that is and what it means, search your heart tonight. Find a place to pray. Let's talk to him at this moment. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we know that we can become callous, Lord. God, we know that we can misunderstand your word. Lord, we can hear all kinds of things of the world and go the wrong direction. We realize that we must seek ye first thy kingdom and thy righteousness. Lord, help us, Lord, to see that need, Lord, to adhere to your word, each and every word from the Bible, to forsake not the assembly in the last days. Lord, to seek thy face, Lord, while you... You may be found, Lord, to be sensitive, Lord, to what the Spirit is saying and to the church. To hear, Lord God, my Lord and my God, we need you so much, Lord. Help us, Lord, to lean more on you and less on this world. For the world will fool us and take us the wrong direction. It might look good for a while, but God, the end thereof will destroy us. Help us to see and realize, Lord, oh, how we need the truth, for the truth will set us free. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts. Thank you, Lord. We want to give you praise and glory, and we ask you, Lord, to instill this word in our hearts tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we hope that we've said something tonight that will touch your heart and keep you seeking the face of God in the right manner. God bless. Have a wonderful evening.